Hello YouTube and welcome to another Minecraft video. I'm currently standing on a redstone computer, unlike any you've seen before. Um, if you've read the title of the video, which is why you clicked on it, then you'll know what it is I'm peddling here. Uh, this computer, when compared to other Minecraft computers, is absolutely tiny. Feel free to um, go on YouTube and take a look at them after watching this, and you'll see what I'm on about. The secret for size for this computer is a 10-bit processor, which essentially has the hardware of a 1-bit processor that deals with the bits one after the other. Now, you'd expect this to be hopelessly slow, but in fact it isn't, because even a conventional computer has to wait for the carryover from out of 1 to get all the way down to out of 10 before they can continue. So, for 1 9 tenths of the time, out of 1 is doing nothing. Essentially, it's reducing, well, eliminating redundancy. What's more, virtually no part of this computer is any more than two repeaters away from any other, so delays in travel time of information are almost non-existent. Now, there is such thing as an instant carryover on a conventional computer in an other, which, in my mind, should allow the creation of monsters capable of taking data from RAM, doing something with it, and saving it back to RAM in only 0.3 seconds. But I must be misunderstanding something, because such a machine has yet to be created. Yet. Dun, dun, dun! I've never actually made a conventional computer, so I wouldn't know. Anyways, this computer can take a number from RAM, do something with it, and save it back to RAM in 3.3 seconds. That's three ticks for each bit, and one for the carryover. Conventional computers seem to generally do the same in between 2.5 and 3 seconds, so I think my computer is a bit slower, but not doing so badly, considering how tiny it is. The reason I can't delegate any less than 3 ticks per bit is that bizarre things start appearing at 2 ticks, and torches fizzle out at 1 tick, so I may work out a 2 tick 1, but I wouldn't hold my breath about it. So, for a quick demonstration, I've done the thing that everybody does with their computers, and made, it goes up the Fibonacci sequence, so do all the things, and let's take a look at it. Maybe we should get some uh, music. Let's get some music in here. One, one, two, three. Is that right? Yeah. I've checked these, it seems to be right. And it's reaching its uh, highest point that can be displayed on this display. So, now I'll give you a quick explanation of the main parts of this computer. I'll start off with the RAM. Quite nice to see it operating there. Um, mainly, I'm starting with this because some of you may find it a bit familiar. Maybe? Kinda? Indeed, this is an indirect descendant of the big thing that I showed you in a previous video, the most common multiple finder. Um, sequential information is obviously pretty easy to store in RAM, because you just feed it into a loop of repeaters and read it off later. Uh, moving on to the processor. It is this thing here, this small square. This thing is, without doubt, the best part of this machine. It can do all the binary operations you could wish for, except shift left and shift right. Um, I didn't include those essentially because this is a proof of concept, and you can imagine that shift left and shift right is very easy with sequential information, because it amounts to delaying it by one, or putting it ahead by one, putting the information ahead by one. So, I wanted to concentrate on more difficult aspects of the design in this computer. The processor has a layout of processor that I saw in a MindWB or, or Jacobs video, um, with an XOR gate between the inputs A and B and the adder. The adder itself I'm very pleased with, is this thing here, this big banana, because uh, not just any adder will do, for every root 
to any given piece of redstone or a torch or repeater in this whole computer must take exactly the same time. You can imagine this was something of a mind puzzle to get right. So I made this special adder. Uh, the initial designs were enormous things, which I probably won't show you, but there's a great big experiment ground uh, somewhere. But uh, now it's looking much nicer, this small thing in here. It functions just like a normal adder, except that the carryover is fed back in as one of the inputs with a delay of exactly one tick. This allows the adder to operate on infinitely large numbers. Um, well, sequential numbers. It'll just take longer to do it, but so do ordinary adders. So there's also an XOR gate between the adder and the output. So these are the two XOR gates between inputs A and B and the adder. And this is the XOR gate uh, coming out. And there's also an OR gate, which you could use instead of the adder if you so wished, if it were required for your program. The setup can also function as a comparator. Uh, and out, it can output all the Boolean expressions you could want if A is greater or equal to B, or if A is greater than B, or if it is A is equal to B, and all that simply by choosing the right operations and then reading the carryover. I'm not sure if this has been done before, but I'd be shocked and appalled if it hadn't. It's a pretty good space saver. The program is, over here is pretty standard. 168 bits programming memory, as you can see here, on two layers, uh, which I found pleasingly compact. Um, the thing here is pleasingly compact, pretty standard stuff though. The thing here is what deals with the conditions. Now I'll show you a cutaway over here. I took a copy of it. This one here is a, an original design, which is actually slightly defunct now, but it's pretty easy to fix. Uh, so, and it doesn't get any bigger. So. It stores which programming lines to go to if the Boolean conditions mentioned before with the processor are or are not met. At the moment, it's working fine, although there's a slight issue with reading the outputs from the adder, which I do not intend to pursue, as this is a proof of concept, um, and a concept which indeed has been proven. I'll definitely reuse this part of the machine. Now lastly, uh, some of you may have already noticed, feel free to observe my stupidity. These two panels, the bottom ones, do more or less exactly nothing at all. Uh, they shouldn't even be there. It was just me being a bit silly, but it's not something I intend to fix because I wanted to get this video out pretty quickly. Besides, there are much more exciting things to look at. Uh, indeed, I'll get on to the exciting bit now. Note this line of repeaters here delays the number before it can be used again. This is necessary. I just got to blow my nose. <laughs> this is necessary because the front end of the number will be coming out of the processor before the tail end has even gone in. This amounts to wasted time when things aren't being done with the number. Note that when you add another processor to a conventional computer, it doesn't make it twice as fast, because programs often, if not usually, require a number to be outputted by the first before it can be operated on by the second. But with a computer like this, however, the second processor can work on the first number while it's still being made, before it's even finished being outputted. This means that stringing together three of these, uh, three of these small processor blocks here you're seeing, we make a processor which can effectively take a number from RAM, do something with it, and save it back to RAM in only one second. I might even be able to improve on that if I redesign the processor. That'd be well faster than most computers out there. Uh, this is something I intend to work on next. Until that time, people, thanks for watching, and goodbye.